Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us for another episode of the JN Irrigation Training Series. I'm Richard Restuccia, your host, and today we're going to be talking about indoor design for indoor cannabis. And, you know, Michael and I were talking briefly beforehand, and he was reminding me, you know, this is just isn't for indoor cannabis, this is for growing anything indoors. And what we're seeing, right, is this big push, controlled environment agriculture is very popular today. Uh, cannabis uh, markets are growing as uh, more and more states are legalizing cannabis, but uh, still a big demand for uh, cannabis from a medical standpoint as well. So we thought we've got Michael Derwenko, who's really an expert in this area and um, hasn't been just on the near term bandwagon. He's been involved in this for years now, helping uh, growers improve their irrigation uh, indoors. And, uh, you know, Michael also has a background as an irrigation contractor. He's uh, worked for manufacturing. Uh, he does a wonderful job uh, working directly with uh, growers. Uh, side by side to really understand what they need to do for their irrigation systems and then actually making it happen. So uh, I always find it great that I can describe something to Michael and then uh, and then he can sit down and, and, and go to work and make that uh, my description happen. It's a, it's a rare talent and Michael has it and Michael's going to take us through this today. So Michael, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Yes, thank you for having me. Yeah, so Michael, the one thing uh, that we've seen, right, a couple of years ago, the uh, the cannabis market was uh, really growing, uh, really just exploding upward. Uh, we've seen a pullback maybe for the last year, year and a half. I'm noticing in the past couple of weeks in particular, I follow some cannabis stocks or some stocks and companies that are, are involved heavily in the cannabis market. They've made a big move in the last couple of weeks uh, up. Uh, which has gone against, like I said, about a year and a half trend. Um, what's it looking like? How is business out there for, uh, for these guys? Um, I mean, we haven't really had too much slowdown. Uh, the large projects um, and a lot of the management resources that I do, um, you know, is pretty consistent throughout the year. I, I, I know the product itself, the inventory was getting a little heavy and saturated in certain parts of the country. But um, I, I don't think that anybody thinks that there's going to be any long-term slowdown. I think, like you said, with the, with the legality and the different legislation that's passing across the country, um, I think it's only a matter of time before uh, inventory is once again depleted and we got to start focusing on projects again. Yeah, that's an interesting comment, right? Every once in a while, uh, we see industries just get pounded investment-wise uh, that are really uh, long-term good potentials. And uh, this uh, just this may be, I don't know, but it may be just uh, one of those cycles. So anyway, well, what do you have for us today? I mean, really, this is a big subject. And to put indoor uh, irrigation design into uh, to one presentation is hard, but uh, I'm guessing you're going to uh, hone in on some key specifics. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the, the, our customers pretty much build our decks when it comes to these these webinars. Um, you know, that's the beauty of being able to interact with the designers, specifiers, contractors, and the end grower. Um, you know, I, I try to base these presentations on questions that I'm hearing out in the field, not necessarily uh, what I what I think people need to hear, but what they want to hear. Mm -hmm. um, and so, to your point, yeah, we're taking on a big subject here. Design is one of the number one questions, not only that I've gotten in the eight years I've been at Jane, but the five or six years prior at a major ResCon manufacturer, um, everybody kind of within a DIY mentality wants to do things themselves. And while I can't come out and show you how to dig a ditch today, what I can do is I can teach you the variables involved uh, when you are trying to design it and kind of lead you to more educated questions. So you're not coming at it blind. Um, I know that our, you know, our, our grow force out there, our tradesmen, um, are perfectly capable of taking these variables and, and doing it themselves. Um, or if not, they can reach out to companies like us that, you know, offer support for in exchange for you just using our, um, our products. And so, um, so hopefully the deck today is, it's about 10 slides long. Um, if you don't get your questions answered here, you can always email me. I'll provide my email. Uh, I'm more than sure people are going to see all this information and need a second to, to process it. Um, and then they can reach out. So um, don't think you have to, uh, to ask your questions while we're live today. Yeah, that's great, Michael. Thank you. And yeah, just want to remind everybody, I do have the chat and the Q&A open. So if you have some questions for Michael or uh, want to make a comment, drop them in there and I'll ask them when appropriate. And uh, we have been given some uh, cool Jane uh, merchandise to uh, people that are asking good questions. So there's that too. 
Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so these these are the main top the main topics that we were we were given. Um, I reached out to growers. You reached out to growers. We have some huge retail partners in the space that we reached out to. Um, while this could have ten bullet points on it, we're going to limit it down to four. Um, I also used some just metaphors and visuals that I learned over the years. Um, I, I will admit that I'm over 40 and I started putting irrigation in when I was about 13 or 14 years old. So um, I've been doing irrigation way longer than I've wanted to do it. And I've done a lot of things improperly many times over and over. So um, I've, I've only learned from my mistakes and a lot of that comes into here. So if it's oversimplified and you don't think that it's the metaphor that needs to be used or you know a different one, let me know. But this is kind of how I think of it um, and how it started to clicking in my head when it came to design. Yeah, that's great, Michael. And the other thing I really appreciate is, uh, you know, as you mentioned, you're kind of talking about what you get questioned about. Right. And this is really the 80 20 rule, right? The questions you keep getting, everybody has. So, uh, really appreciate you uh, specifying that. Yeah. And the good thing about the grow market is everyone's pretty in tune. They know it's, I wouldn't say a new market. I know we've been growing in our garages and attics for a long time, but now that it's out in the open and um, there's not the stigma attached to it in some of these big operations, the, there's very simple questions being asked. And when I was younger, I was always afraid to ask simple questions. Um, and that's why I would improperly install stuff and have to learn the hard way. Um, the older generation was just not as willing to provide the support that maybe the newer generation is. And so um, what I wanted to start off with was just simple component placement. These are the components. Uh, this is where they're typically put on a line in the order in a linear process um, or installation. And where is your good starting point? And so with the first slide, uh, as you can see, we have a very popular setup in the middle. These are octobubblers or anybody's uh, multi-port manifolds. This is for a table with a high plant count. So we've got really small potted plants, one gallon, uh, maybe three gallon at the largest. Uh, you know, each multi-port is, ours provides eight. They have, I believe, 10s and 12s. Um, if you go into a higher count below, but above eight, the main reason we settled on eight ports was because we're trying to limit liability. A lot of what we're gonna talk today is about limiting liability, zoning. You know, we could put um, 5,000 plants on a single zone valve, but if that one zone valve fails, you're losing 5,000 plants. And so not only are we trying to conserve water, we're trying to reduce liability in a lot of these installations. And so with the Octobubble, you've got eight ports, um, you know, you can maintenance that, you have eight plants. If you lose eight plants, 16 plants because of clogging or failure, uh, you know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna lose too much. Um, so what we wanna do is we wanna compartmentalize our liability. And what we do, what we use to do that is we use a zone valve in the top left corner. Can you see my arrow, Richard? Yeah, it looks great. Okay, so so this little zone valve, it's a glow valve. It, uh, it It's very similar to the flapper in the back of your toilet. It's got a diaphragm inside, the water pushes it up or the water pushes it down to open and close. Um, while for design purposes, what we're talking about today is does that mechanism inside slow water down? Of course it does. Does it eat up some of the flow? Um, of course it does. And there's two, two variables which we'll go into to detail on today are flow and pressure. Um, flow is essentially the water, the mass, um, and the energy behind it is the pressure. We're actually pushing it with, um, with air pressure, which then becomes water pressure essentially. So what we need to do is we need to trap that just like we do a tire on a car. We need to trap that air pressure or that water pressure. And what we do, how we do that is instead of the little um, where you fill your car tire up, we're gonna have a valve there. And that's gonna be a valve that can respond to an electronic controller turning this system on and off and sending water into, um, into our lines, through our filters, through our tubes, through our fittings, and ultimately out the air relief valve, which is gonna be on the far end of the zone. So what we're gonna cover is the variables involved in moving that mass through these components uh, into our plants or through our flush valves on the outer side. Yeah, so it's interesting, Michael, I saw in your opening slide, you even pointed out that a lot of these uh, uh, indoor grow facilities might have two stories. So yeah. this gets more complicated because now you're going uphill or you're going to the second story. There's a lot more to it than, uh, than maybe a, a typical landscape. I think it's like when we did the uh, when I did my photography webinar and you said somebody responded, I learned just enough to know that I need to hire someone to do it. <laughs> so I think when you get into when you start moving water vertically, which, you know, we'll touch on that a little bit. A lot of times uh, guys are running uh, pipes up walls and then over walls. Uh, we weren't doing that in in the field when we were installing sprinklers. We might have grade changes, but never were we going up a 12 foot hill and then right back down a 12 foot hill. 
And uh, you could argue that, you know, once the water goes over, you kind of, the foot ahead kind of catches you up. But those system variables make it, make it very challenging to, to figure out how many heads you can put on a zone. Um, did, did you have any questions about this layout here, Richard? Um, I've reviewed these components in past webinars. I don't want to get too hung up on the individual components. If people have follow-up questions, they can ask me. Um, but ultimately, this is kind of shows how the water is going to move through the system. Yeah, we have our first question on that illustration. It has to do with the valve placement now. Uh, and, and this is what they're asking, right? So the illustration shows the valve right next to the table, but it may not be there. It might be on the wall or someplace else. It was just to give the, uh, it was just put there for um, the purpose of showing that you needed a valve. Yeah, illustrative purposes. Yeah, um, um, yeah. most of the time they're gonna go on the wall. Um, I, I will tell you, I prefer to have my valves in the cluster closer to the table, not right there, but on the wall in it, because the alternative is you put all your valves, a lot of guys will put valves out in their veg, in their um, reservoir rooms where the water's coming in. Um, there's, there's a benefit to that too. I would uh, say use a master valve in your, in your res room and then put individual zone valves on the wall in each room. Um, I like having kind of the, the ability to manually override something when I'm in the room to flush it. Uh, if you've got to turn a controller on and go to the other room for a controller, um, you know, to maintenance it, that can be a cumbersome process. So I like having the valves in there to, to flush filters or, uh, you know, look at chemicals and stuff like that. It, it, it really doesn't matter if you, what well, we'll talk about friction loss, you're going to have coming a smaller, you're going to have a smaller pipe coming out of that valve. It's harder to move large volumes of water through smaller pipe. So you can yeah. use, you use one inch and a half, two inch lines into the rooms, bring a lot of water in and then segment it once you're in the room. Yeah, it's a really good point, Michael, because, um, you know, I got to admit, I don't do every repair perfectly. Every once in a while, I have to redo it, and I turn that water on. If I'm close to where the repair is, I see the see the problem before it gets too big. As long as people are clustering their valves together and their filters together, that's fine. Just don't put one valve here, one valve here, you know, one far away. You need them, you need them clustered. It's uh, It really doesn't make much sense to have them separated too much. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, Thank you. And then uh, the reason I wanted to do this is I think this illustrates kind of what we're about to go into, which is uh, the, the force behind, behind the mass. And when water goes through our system, through our valves, through our filters, it ultimately comes out the flush valve and the same pressure that opened the diaphragm seals it back up. And so that eliminates debris and air from the lines. Um, but that is essentially as that water came out of there, that is what we're going to be getting into um, here is we're trying to move water from one place to another. Don't think it's anything more than that. Yeah, um, so on that flush valve, um, does that flush your system every time you uh, turn the valve on and off? Yeah, so every time the system is introduced to water, um, it's, gonna, it's gonna fill the lines, push it out, and then seal up. And then it's also gonna open up just a little bit when the system ends, so the system is not left under pressure. So you don't get, um, if you don't have check valves in every one of your heads, you're not gonna get bleeding water out of them. Yeah, wow, that's a great advantage, right? I know uh, a lot of people just uh, from lack of time, we're all very busy, don't flush their systems as often as they uh, need to, and this is kind of taking care of it for you. Yeah, and you're gonna have to displace a little bit of water once it comes out, but um, a lot of times people use that opportunity to put it in a bucket and kind of look at their, you know, their mixtures or their teas and see what's coming out of the system. You know, it's a, you can check at the filter and you can check at the flush valve um, to see exactly what your plants are, uh, you know, getting into. Yeah, oh, very cool. They're making a deposit. So um, obviously the, uh, the number one question we get is, you know, how many octobubblers can I put on a zone? And um, I usually just tell people 10 because then the, the next question is, how do you know 10? And it's like, exactly. <laughs> how am I gonna know how many octobobers you want on there? There's a lot of system variables that I need to know before I can make that decision. And um, knowing how many plants you're watering and how long your table is, is not all the information you need. But as a manufacturer, we can provide what the operating specs are for the individual products and we can help you work towards it given you know the site variables that you have. Um, the, the number one thing we get is the 10 gallon per hour octobubbler or any of the octobubblers for that. Instance. Does each port put out the same amount of wa water? Um, do they put out 10 gallons per hour total across all eight ports? Um, and so I wanted to answer that right away. And basically what it is, is each port puts out 0.16 gallons per minute, um, which is a total of 1.28 uh, 
gallons per minute for the whole octobubbler. So uh, that's not a lot of water. It's low volume for a reason. That's this is the ten gallon one. Um, you know, and what do I have? Twenty gallons. Oh, so if we have if we're running twenty gallons per minute through a valve, uh, that means we can run fourteen octobubblers. So um, and that doesn't have anything to do with your pipe sizing or your valve sizing yet. You need to start with the uh, the demand of the system. How many plants am I trying to water? What mechanism is am I, am I using to water those plants and work your way backwards? Now that we've built the demand, you can basically replace this octobubbler with any emission device, which I think, I, before I move on, I did wanna show the operating pressures at the bottom, uh, 20 to 60 PSI with the different flows. Uh, we're gonna get into pressure here shortly. These are the two variables. Remember, uh, operating pressure and then flow. So, Michael, we have another question coming in, and this question has to do with, uh, you know, the num the total number of octobubblers on a zone. That's going to change. Depend does that change depending on uh, twenty gallon, ten gallon, six gallon, or two gallon per hour? Hmm. Uh, good question. Yeah, for sure, it does. Um, I mean, the, the higher the flow volume, the more demand. Um, so the fewer octobubblers. Um, but remember, you're not trying to run a whole system at once. You're trying to run a zone at once. So if you 14 octobubblers on a zone, um, you know, times eight, what's that, 90, it's almost 100 plants. Um, that's a lot of plants. And so uh, this goes back to, we don't want to lose 100 plants. So that 20 gallons per minute puts us a little over a one inch valve, I believe. Um, that's probably an inch and a half valve, just because you want to size up a little bit. You, know, you can always crank it down if you want. Um, so you got an inch and a half valve. That's a pretty big valve. Um, I don't. I don't think you need to go any bigger than that. You don't need to put any more plants on it. Yeah, that's interesting, right? Because the table you showed in the previous slide is a four by eight table with uh, eight octobubblers on it. So you could have uh, over ten of those tables. You could have twelve yep. of those tables on one zone, and that might be more than you want. Uh, One hundred and four plants. Yeah. Um, yep. Yep. It's all about uh, limiting risk. And uh, any more than that, I, it just doesn't make any sense to do it. Uh, the plants are too valuable to risk it. Um, and I wanted to put this in the middle of the presentation. If you're thinking, where do I learn about all those products that I just talked about? Um, we have a very simple irrigation solutions guide that if you want to email me, it's not up on our website. Uh, if you want to email me, I can send it to you. But it basically has the part numbers, the quantities, um, and the different ordering options for each product that is relevant to um, this presentation. Um, so instead of just kind of putting part numbers throughout the document, uh, you can ask me and I'll provide this and it, it gives you kind of a, maybe the top 20, 30, 20, 30 products that you need to, uh, to irrigate. Wow, super, super helpful. Thank you for putting that together. Yeah. Um, all right, flow, this is our mass. This is, this is what I learned a long time ago and this is how simple this is. When, um, when you're about to ask, how many octobubblers can I put on a zone? The first thing you do, question I'm going to ask is, what is your flow? How much water do we have to move? Um, we know we need between 20 and 40 pounds of pressure, but how much water do we have to move? And so uh, the first thing you're going to do is get a five gallon bucket, go to your water source, fill it up. Um, how many times were you able to fill it up in one minute? One time, that means you have five gallons per minute. So it's pretty simple. Now, are there more accurate ways to do this? Yes, they have. Um, you know, clear rulers, I'm sure that uh, meters with a, a ball inside um, that you can put on there. Uh, there's flow meters that, you know, obviously when we use our smart controllers, we have flow meters on there. So if you know you're going to put a smart controller on there, install this flow sensor, install the flow, uh, the controller and just run the zone out, you know, through a hose and see what your flow is. And then you can design the whole system accordingly. If you, if you don't, can't do that, then fill up a five gallon bucket and it'll at least get you close. We're gonna end up oversizing the valve anyways and undersizing the zone to account for any, you know, you know, any inaccuracies. So I would start with a five gallon bucket and fill it up. And if it takes only 30 seconds to fill it up, then you know you got 10 gallons per minute. I would find that hard to believe um, through like a spigot or something, uh, larger water sources, you know, this thing's gonna be filling up very quickly. So. It's a good starting point, at least, because that's the first thing I'm going to ask is, do you have more than five gallons per minute? Uh, most of the time, uh, people don't. They're pulling off a sub pump. They're only getting one and a half, two gallons per minute and then wondering why an octobubbler that takes um, upwards of two gallons per minute to run isn't working. So, Or there's inconsistencies in how much water is coming out of each port. That's typically because we have flow issues. Um, there's usually more than enough pressure because the pumps say 40 PSI, uh, but 
if we don't have the mass in front of it, the diaphragm inside the octobubbler can't open up and distribute the water appropriately. Yeah, I love that bucket test. The one thing I've noticed is when I tell people to try the bucket test, they always say, I'll never fill up a bucket in a minute. And then they're always surprised to see how much water does come out. Or when you have one pop-up on a row of 60 pop-ups that breaks for one hour and it runs and you look at the flow report and you burn through 40 gallons. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's when, as we know, large municipalities and um, apartment complexes, that's how you sell them on flow sensors is one broken head basically is you know two weeks worth of water for that zone. So yeah, um, yeah and then I put a note at the bottom. Um, so I did, uh, as you mentioned, other manufacturer call support when I was younger and uh, you know, there is not necessarily a standard. A lot of California homes when I was there, um, you know, you guys have the brass bell uh, regulator in your garages because California has, um, you have such an infrastructure to move large volumes of water, maybe not to store it, but we're very good at moving it out there. Thus you have 60, 70, I've seen 80 pounds of pressure um, coming out of a, a meter. So I think there's significant pressure in California. Everything needs to be regulated, heads, valves, um, you know, uh, definitely drip zones. Uh, and so I would say if you're towards the West Coast and you're not in Humboldt County or anywhere south of that, plan on having plenty of pressure, just making sure your reservoir is big enough and you're sizing your lines that are going into your rooms large enough that we're moving the volume of water we need to for those high pressures, or you can regulate down. In Florida, we have um, very, very old, small iron pipe. I don't know why. Um, my house that was renovated from the meter has a brand new line and I maybe have 35 pounds of pressure. So even running a drip zone, um, I had to like segment it out. Um, so we do not have a lot of pressure. We used to put about three rotors on a zone here when I was putting systems in. So uh, that was, that was a, I was very fortunate about that in California. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you need some more hills there in Florida. Put the water so, source. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so and then in, the, in that same measure, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, so just like how many, how many heads can I put on a table? Here is how to calculate your gallons per minute. So uh, drip zone products or drip products are usually measured in gallons per hour um, because they're low volume, high efficiency. Um, but remember, we're usually, we're usually measuring gallons per minute for a lot of our um, primary components, our valves, our filters, our pumps, uh, things like that. So uh, there are two different measurements. Uh, it's very easy to figure out, you just divide it by 60. Um, in this case, if you have 25 octobubblers, you know that they're using 10 gallons per hour, 250 divided by 60 gets us four gallons per minute. Uh, that's well within the range of a three quarter inch valve um, or a one inch valve. Three quarter inch valve, just for, I didn't put it down here, but for the people listening, I would say, well, Richard, a three quarter inch valve is gonna do anywhere from probably one and a half gallons, maybe two gallons per minute, um, upwards of 10 gallons per minute. And then a, um, a one inch valve is gonna go from eight to probably like 15 or 16, uh, anything over that, you might wanna jump up into an inch and a half unless you're right teetering. Uh, do remember you need some force to open those diaphragms. So irrigation valves like ours will not open with half a gallon per minute. I think we say they will, but I would, um, anybody's globe valve, uh, it just doesn't, there's a little bit of liability there. So I would always uh, make sure you have enough flow and pressure. And then the one below it is we sell a lot of these emitter, these manifolds, single, dual, and four-way. Um, they eat up water too, not a lot, two gallon, um, you know, two gallons per minute for 50 click tiffs. Uh, if you split it, if you split a click tiff um, four ways, uh, four, that's 200 plants. So um, you could get uh, you could water a lot of plants on a single zone for two gallons per minute. Um, now that cycle is gonna take way too long. Um, so you know, you're going to break it up, but, but this just, I hope this shows um, the demands of the drip components that we're using in these setups, um, how low it is, because I think all too often I get the photos and it's four octobubblers with a four horsepower pump and a giant reservoir. And it's like, you can, you're completely, you're doing the opposite. They're, they're either, either over designing or under designing, and we need to find a happy medium. And hopefully these examples will provide that. Right, because uh, over-design uh, will be too expensive and uh, you, you could have saved the money and an under-design is going to cost you later in, uh, in redoing your, um, your setup. Yeah, and you know, that's why just knowing some of these simple design, these simple design um, definitions will help. Um, 
especially help in the troubleshooting process. Like, okay, like I said earlier, if an octobubbler isn't distributing water consistently around all the ports, it's not typically because you don't have enough pressure. It's typically because you don't have water. Um, either the line coming out of your reservoir is too small and your pump's trying to pump more water than it can. Um, you can hear when a pump isn't running at full capacity. You can hear it kind of like the bubbles in it. And, um, you know, when I was younger, I could hear a tin horse centrifugal when it wasn't fully primed and running, you can kind of hear it fluttering. Um, so, and what's, what's making it more complicated, and we'll talk about pumps here in a second, I'm doing my time, is um, they, they make them adjustable now. And so because they're adjustable, um, if they start to flutter, people either turn them down or they turn them up. So you have one more kind of uh, human error aspect that can happen. Um, and so I think if you start from the, the physics of it, it's better than trying to start with the, the products in the system. Um, so moving on to, uh, to every designer's favorite. The friction loss is by far, I think, the biggest mystery to a lot of designers. I think those other ones are pretty easy to calculate. Friction loss is by no means easy to calculate, well, in comparison to the previous. Um, friction loss is where we're losing water, where we're losing pressure. Um, as water moves through a piece of pipe, inside that pipe at a microscopic level, um, there are thorns, it's very edgy. And um, that those thorns basically, um, or bumps, slow water down and we call it friction loss. It creates friction, we lose it. If you're running 100 feet of pipe, under a certain amount of, with a certain amount of water running through it, it, we're gonna lose ultimately some of the pressure running through it. The pressure that we lose is built into friction loss charts, like the one here. Um, as you can see, it starts at half inch, goes up to five inch. It's two different kinds of pipe, a rigid and a flex. Rigid is most PVC, uh, schedule 40. Um, pipe size, three quarter to five, and then the flow rate running through it is the one thing you're gonna need to know. And so that's why I went in this order um, was because I wanted you to calculate the gallons per minute on your system. Now you can reference the friction loss chart to see what the liability is of moving that, that mass through the pipe. Does that make sense, Richard? Yeah, so oh, I think one place where I see this often is, uh, you know, if uh, just at home, if I'm putting two um, uh, lengths of uh, hose together, you know, garden hose, two 50 foot lengths. I know that when I do that, the uh, the pressure of the water coming out the end is very different than what's uh, going in the, uh, at the start. Yeah, and very much like the infrastructure and the plumbing of your house, it's not like we're outside where everything is kind of flat. Um, it's going into a valve, it's coming out of valve. And while I know we do slopes and grade changes and there are exceptions, um, but for the most part, you're running it flat. Well, when you're running pipe from your meter in your house, it's not flat. It's going into the house, it's going up, it's going over, it's going down, it's going into a shower, it's coming out, going into a tub, it's going into a faucet over here, it's dead ending over here. All those elbows, all those ups and downs ultimately slow the water down. And that's one of the things you need to calculate is not only are, do you have devices that are eating up and consuming water and flow, but you have the the method and the of conduit or the you know the pipe to get it there the route to get it there um, that's also eating it up now just like the flows before i will say uh in drip it's a little easier um, and more forgiving on the design side outside when you're spraying water overhead um friction loss is a, is a big deal because you need so much water to run pop-ups and rotors inside um, we don't necessarily need as much water less water means less pressure loss and so I think that's accurate, right? Yes, that's accurate. Um, because uh, you're not you're not trying to move as much volume um, through a huge line, and so it's it's not it's not as big a deal as um, as you'd think, but it's definitely something to consider. Which is why we want our valves as close to our plants as possible, because then we can make sure that the backside of the valve um, is always charged, ready to go, and we can measure from there on out. Uh, we're not trying to measure two different two different yes, lengths of pipe. Yeah, we're getting a question here, uh, Michael. Do I want to flow my water as fast as I can? Uh, so, so, so five feet per second. So um, five feet per second is kind of the rule of thumb. Um, it, you know, landscape and irrigation devices in general, we don't want to, we don't want the water moving any faster than that. We're going to start either blowing things apart um, or, you know, as I explained with the toilet flapper inside our, our multi-port manifold or the check valve inside a pop-up or rotor, any of these components, um, they are made to simply open and close, not to withstand pressures of an airplane. And so any more than five feet per second, um, I think you're gonna be pushing the, the extent of what you need. It's gonna be overkill, unnecessary, glues are gonna stop working. Uh, it's just, uh, it, it's not necessary. 
Yeah, great point. What a, a gallon of water weighs about eight pounds. So uh, <laughs> that can really start hammering things around. Exactly. And that's when you're moving water up and down. That's why, you know, people who live in condos or taller buildings, you get that water hammer, you got to put arresters on it because of that. Um, you know, a lot of pressure behind force and it's slamming, slamming through your system. It's just going to shake things. It's, um, it's unnecessary. Um, and, and there's just no reason for it. That's why uh, the good thing about this presentation is it's mostly about drip. And so uh, a lot of this stuff is very, it's very forgiving. Um, I did want to put a chart up here uh, because all these components that I'm mentioning, uh, talking about, I'm talking about the flow demand, how much water they need to actually distribute it based on their manufacturer specifications. But um, there's also charts that for each one of these products to show exactly how much pressure that they take to run um, and how to size them. You mentioned the valve sizing earlier. Um, this flow characteristics chart is an example of one of our uh, friction loss charts or flow charts um, for, uh, for our valves. And you can, you can see exactly what your flow is. If I'm running 12 gallons per hour and I need to be right here in the recommended operating spec of five to 10, 10 PSI, that puts me right about here. Then I want a three quarter inch valve. So, um, or a, excuse me, a one inch valve. So you can read these charts and, and determine your flow sizing. The, the tools are there once you know what these variables are. And it's as simple as pressure and flow, which hopefully I'm making some impact on today. Yeah, so that's interesting, Michael. So I'm thinking um, you want to start with the end in mind, right? Because you have to know how much total water you're going to flow at any one time based on your design. And then you have to figure out things that um, like length of pipe or your elbows or your valve. Everything takes friction, right? It, take, it, it reduces the amount. Yeah, and I mean, the, the industry, like any industry, has become relatively standardized where reservoirs aren't you know, 50,000 uh, gallons of water. Um, it, basically, everything inherently has to be of a certain size. We're usually not running pipe in size bigger than two inches because of liability, because of cost, uh, because there's no reason to do it. It's drip irrigation. Um, if Maybe there's a two-inch line going from one res to another into an RO unit. But ultimately, as the water source uh, dwindles down to the plant itself, you're just slowly sizing a system down. And knowing how to size it down, where to size it down, the components involved, and the demand of each component, that's ultimately what you're doing, is you're just stepping it down so a very um, simple device can distribute the water properly. Um, yeah, and love, this is just explaining those two things. Yeah, I love conceptually how you, how you did that, right? We just have to think about the total first. That's great. I, you, can only, you can only be so wrong. Now, outside, you can be really wrong. You start digging through cable and digging through sewage lines. That's a problem. The, the benefit of this and the forgivingness of this is that we're never going to need to go too big with our lines. Our water demand should never be too high where the liability is flooding rooms. If that's the case, then, then we started very wrong. Um, and so we've done a few of these webinars now, and I, I think we're painting the picture that is, you know, you're basically operating from three quarter inches to, or maybe even half inch to two inches. Um, so we're never moving water like on this chart uh, past a certain mark. And so that if you start looking at these charts like that, um, this below one, which is for fittings, fittings also have drag or friction loss. Um, you know, and they, there's a formula where you take each one of these uh, these variables and you're going to input it into your situation. I'll say we can go on about the formula um, too. email me. I'll talk to you about it. But basically, you're going to put that variable into it and that's going to tell you exactly how much friction loss you're getting on your total system. Um, you and I did one yesterday as an example. What did we, we put four or five different elbows on a system and I think it came down to a couple PSI. So, um, and that was without 200 feet of pipe. So it's very, very low um, and people should not be overly concerned on it. But as we've talked about in the past, if you can reduce your pipe size as much as possible, you reduce your costs. There's no point in running, running schedule 80 one inch pipe and putting 60 octobubblers on a zone just so it looks cool because you're just eating into your profits. It's, it's complete overkill. And so um, I think if you stick with smaller pipe, I learned that on big landscape jobs is, yeah, you can run one inch pipe for all your pop-ups and just jack up the, the pump size. But why are you wasting all that money on one inch pipe when you can slowly scale it down? And so that's if we do this properly, the majority of your money goes into your primary infrastructure, your reses, your ROs, uh, your valves, your filters. And then after that, everything gets very cheap because we're not really reliant on um, you know, overkill in manufacturing and, and innovation uh, because we've done everything on the front end. Yeah.
Well, that's great. And that's, uh, <laughs> that's really important, right? Uh, uh, saving that money so you can invest it in other uh, important places. Right, right. And uh, on the photo is right. That's a fertigation setup. Fertigation also eats into um, pressure and flow. Uh, there are charts that you can reference for this. This, in, this particular project had, I think, nine with a pH balancer. So we're moving a lot of water through those um, to get... Um, to get those in, so we got to size the pump accordingly. If each one of those, just for instance, you know, eats up a, a gallon and a half of water and maybe uh, four or five psi through friction loss, then we need to multiply that times nine, size the pump accordingly. Um, you know, the demand of the res room basically with the demand of the output per zone is going to be our. Um, I was going to say liability, but our our total demand, and uh, that's how we're going to size our pump, which segues into pump sizing. So once we've established measuring our flow, what the demand is of our components, measuring pressure, um, which like I said, you're gonna do from your pump right here, we'll explain that. Um, and then now friction loss, you should have all the variables you need uh, to size out an irrigation zone. Um, the beauty of indoor growing is there has been some innovation in pump technology. Uh, this, this easy box from DAB uh, is, I see it on every site. I'm sure most growers and specifiers do. It's adjustable. Um, so you can adjust it from, what is it? Uh, basically, I think five or 10 PSI upwards of 86, which I hope you don't do. Um, and 32 gallons per minute, which I also hope you don't do. But a lot of times people are using one of these to fill something too. So maybe it's pulling from one res, going into another res, um, not always on the end system. So just cause you see 32, don't push it to the limits. Um, I think the rule of thumb is 15% off max, basically um, 10 to 15% off of the max. So you wanna be at about um, 22, 25 gallons per minute. With the easy box, that pump, um, I think it's four or 500 bucks, maybe a little more. Hmm. Um, the leader pump centrifugal is more water cooling. It's got a fan on it. It needs to have water running through it at all times. While the first one um, is gonna shut down in an overheating event, um, you're gonna pay for that the centrifugal one more than likely is not. I think some of them now do have shutoffs where they'll shut off, but don't, you know, don't count on that. Um, if that thing dries up the reservoir prior to it, it doesn't have water to pull through it. That's how it cools its rotors. Um, it's gonna, it's gonna burn up and you're gonna be replacing the seals. Yeah, so a couple of questions uh, coming in, Michael. The first one, oh, I wanna mention, one of our attendees has their hand up, uh, but you need to type your question into the uh, Q and A or the chat. And we'll answer it there. <clears throat> the other question has to do with uh, pumps. If I'm uh, if I'm in California and I've got sixty pounds of pressure coming in to my uh, facility, why why do I need a pump? No, you don't. Um, I mean, but if you have sixty pounds of pressure and you've got nine fertigation connections, like we just showed, you, and then you also have potentially fifteen or twenty octobubblers that you need forty pounds of pressure. Remember, if we're moving water from one room over a wall into another room, and then it's going to, to demanding components, um, we're, we've got a lot of friction loss there. So you might start off with 60 PSI at your street, but by the time you're at that last octobubbler, through friction loss and through uh, you know, different components eating into that pressure, you might only have 20 PSI. And yeah. that happens a lot. And um, you know, just like the elbows we said, every elbow is gonna eat up some, every component's gonna eat up some. Um, and so 60 at the beginning is the difference between, you know, basically static and dynamic pressure at this point is, yeah, you might have 60 with nothing on it, but once you start attaching things, once you start turning all the showers on in your house, the hose in the backyard is not going to work as good. So, yeah. I mean, you need to take that into account that, um, which, which is why you'd put a pump in a booster pump ultimately. Uh, so when that demand exists your booster pump clicks on. So 60 PSI might run the bathrooms and everything else uh, in the house, but once the, the backyard or once the, the grow room needs additional pressure at the same time, the booster pump's gonna come on. Uh, given the water that it needs is there, it's gonna pull it from it and help. Yeah, okay, great. Now that really, that helped the whole thing. That helped put the whole thing together. So yeah, definitely understand. Yeah, we, we use booster pumps in, um, in irrigation for obvious reasons. We're trying to move water long distances. Uh, the demand fluctuates. Maybe we only need 20 gallons per minute now, but we need 60 for the big soccer field. Um, so booster pumps gonna kick on. Um, booster pumps and kind of that is, is, is its own monster uh, because you've gotta have the volume of water 
Um, so it can maybe supply, you know, one building and then also your grow room when it comes on. So we'd have to use probably like a two inch line to go into the, the pump and the house. That way the volume of water is always equal to the pressure and the demand that we need. Yeah. Okay. Very good. And the same thing is true with a centrifugal pump. It's just not going to move as much water um, as fast, um, or in this case, 87 PSI. But um, if you, you can only move so much water so fast, uh, there should be no reason uh, you need anything bigger than a, the demand of this centrifugal pump other than the automation aspect. Um, you're not going to be there all the time when it's running. You want the fail safe that it's going to shut off in the event of a, a reservoir drying up. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. And then lastly, a sub pump. Um, a lot of guys will use these just for mixing their teas. They'll drop it into a, a 40 or 50 gallon trash can um, and they'll either hand water their teas or they'll just use it with an aerator on it. Uh, so basically mix the stuff around and then you would have a bigger uh, centrifugal or dab uh, pulling from that, you know. So uh, it's very, very common to have a mixture of all of these pumps, um, you know, around a site, especially if you're pulling off reservoirs, which most growers are. Most growers are not just pulling tap water out of a sink and putting it on cannabis plants. It's, it's going to an intermediary somewhere. Um, whether or not you want to put the pump on the front end to fill the reservoir or on the back end to pull from the reservoir is up to you. Um, but, you know, hopefully this kind of tells you what you needed to know to, um, to know the demand of your system. Oh, wow. That was a lot of information. Yeah. Very good, though. Uh, I really appreciate that, Michael. Uh, really helped not just give me an overall uh, understanding of what should go into an indoor system, but uh, some really great specifics, too. Yeah, I, I really hope that, you know, educated questions come out of it. Um, there's no way we're going to answer everything. But these are very popular questions that I get. Um, I think a lot of growers have very simple setups that they kind of just maybe overthink. Um, you could always play with it. It's, it's always on top of the ground before you mount anything permanently. Um, like I said, not only the bucket test, but put a flow sensor on the system first or measure your pressure first um, before you even start connecting your, uh, your lateral lines. Uh, that way you have some idea before you call me, you can say, look, you know, like the question, I have 60 PSI at my tap. Um, I'm filling up the bucket, you know, two times a minute. Uh, then I can say, well, this is your demand. How far is your room from the, the, where we're taking these measurements? How big are your reservoirs? How much do you want to water? And how many components do we have eating into it? Uh, that makes it way easier to have those, those variables to help um, more so than just pretty pictures of a bunch of cannabis plants in a room. That does nothing for me. So uh, hopefully this uh, leads to more involved questions. Yeah, so I see you've got your contact information on here, Michael. Is it okay for people to contact you and uh, ask you these questions as they're going about their uh, their designs? Yeah, yeah, I'm on Twitter from more of an informative government, um, you know, um, talk just talking about legalities and whatnot. Uh, I, I do run the Instagram account for Jane's USA. We try to keep it as a database for educational tools, not really use it for a lot of promotion. Um, you know, so it's more of a library. Um, so you can always talk to me about there. Everybody DMs, and I'm usually the one that responds. Sorry if it takes a day. We get a lot of them, uh, but I'll respond. Or you can shoot me an email. And if you're going to shoot me an email, just start right away with photos, system dynamics, um, problems you've already had, water quality, uh, you know, anything you can think that's going to help me get to a, a better answer faster. That way I don't have to respond with a million questions um, and we go back and forth. Um, I know I do Zoom calls all week long. So once I get some variables from you and have answers for you, um, we can always set up a Zoom call and go over it and I'll help you specify, I'll help you design, help you do whatever you want. Yeah. Okay. Well, great. Thanks so much, Michael, for uh, bringing this information to us today. I want to thank all the viewers for joining us for a part of your day. I know everybody's uh, crazy busy these days, so we appreciate you spending some of your day with us to uh, uh, educate yourselves on uh, water management, conservation, and proper irrigation. It's uh, really uh, empowering, uh, right? Uh, helps get us up in the morning to know that people really want this information. So you can see all our trainings at the Jane's USA website, uh, Jane's USA usa.com forward slash trainings or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast right we extract the uh, audio out of this and we put it on a podcast too i love it that people are out there working every day listening to our podcast and educating at the same time so again michael thank you very much i hope you'll come back uh, yeah. i know there's a lot we didn't cover i hope you'll come back in the, the next few months and uh, we can talk about this some more yeah let's get some feedback and see what people want to hear Okay. Sounds great. Thank you, everybody. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you.